So we've heard the resounding message that uh, what counts most in us is perhaps a web of neurons, and that if we learn how those neurons fire, we will come closer to understanding who we really are. And perhaps we will truly follow the ancient dictum, know thyself. But are we really our brains? And I'm going to address this question by talking about emotions, which are such an intimate aspect of who we are in our lives. When I uh, worked myself in a neuroscience laboratory, the question of whether I'm a brain surfaced mostly in the evenings when, exhausted for having conducted experiments all day, I stood in front of dirty glassware piled up in the sink, my lab coat stained with chemicals, and my thoughts also in need of a rinse. <laughs> And collecting biological fragments, um, uh, biological information, was for me like deciphering a tale um, written in code about the mind that I myself, with my own experiments, was trying to, um, to, to understand and was trying to um, contribute to writing. And the protagonists were brain tissues, neurons, DNA, laboratory, animals. But when I made my way home, those characters stayed behind and I would latch on to another story, that of my own emotional life, of which I was the only protagonist, with my own script, the lines and movements of which were still to be discovered and written. So can this neural script indeed tell us how we feel or teach us about our emotions? In search for an answer, I plowed through um, episodes in my own emotional life and I turned to writing about them. So I confronted life experience with knowledge of the brain, or what I knew about the brain. So, um, for instance, once I felt a nagging sense of guilt for having disappointed a friend. And uh, when I tried to work out that guilt and understand how difficult it is to overcome it, I realized that instead of, instead of inspecting the brain scan of strangers feeling guilt, in studies that claim to have localized the exact position of guilt in the brain, I gain more comfort in contemplating a painting by Caravaggio in which he paints himself as the beheaded um, giant Goliath after he murdered a man in Rome. So two completely different images showing the same emotion, but one more directly talking to my, to my feelings. On a cold night in December, um, as I sat in a late night bar with a friend who was in the throes of a bout of anxiety for the economic crisis, knowledge of the plasticity of the brain and fear conditioning experiments on rats was useful in understanding that we can override unwanted patterns of fear. Um, but it was not sufficient to, to describe the lived experience of anxiety, its existential meaning that my friend Robert and I better derived from philosophy. On another occasion, I was stuck with the composition of a sonnet. And so I know that the dialogue between the pleasure center in my brain and the prefrontal cortex mediated the creative process and made me feel joy and conclude the poem eventually, going from a chaotic set of words to a finished um, song. But scribbles, erasures on my notebook mark the tempo of the production of the sonnet, line after line, syllable after syllable, stress after stress. So the brain processes underline this creation and knowledge of them were something parallel to, but also independent from the poetic undertaking. And hours spent observing mouse mothers taking good or bad care of their pups taught me that the way we approach or love someone in our adult life is the shadow of ways of loving learned during childhood, and that such habits do reside and can be modified in the brain. But I also learned that from by reading a lapidary poem by Philip Larkin and from first-hand trial and error experience in relationships. Um, reading Plato, writing a play on the Capgras syndrome and brushing up Shakespeare sonnets <laughs> was also better information to understand the, uh, that love is blind, that love is madness and that the suspension of judgment about the beloved we experience um, is better than knowing with exactitude which neurotransmitters bathe the brain or which regions in the brain light up or not when we see the image of our beloved. And ultimately what I've learned 
um, from this journey from, from my emotions is that it is through stories, stories of everyday life, that it's possible to convey to a general public up-to-date brain research, but also a balanced view of both its potential and limitations. So it is through this creative way of talking about the brain that we can appreciate when, how, and to what extent we are our brains, at least in our emotional lives. So in some, when I experience an emotional incident in my life as a colleague, a friend, a son, or a lover, neuroscience is, is not exclusively what I, what I turn to and search for answers. So the brain subtext of DNA, chemical fluctuations that I talked about at the beginning, does not always contribute to composing the daily script of my emotional life. So it is always fascinating information, but sometimes only a minor footnote. So are we our brains? And I would say that yes, we are bodies that experience life and respond constantly to the environment. Um, emotions are things that happen to our bodies. We learn and unlearn behavior, we learn and unlearn emotional patterns. But knowledge about the brain is growing, has its limitations, and while it accumulates to cover the distance that separates us from understanding our emotional lives, I think we are entitled to take all kinds of shortcuts and to draw inspiration from all kinds, from all sorts of um, knowledge. So I'll conclude by saying that many, maybe there are different roads that can lead us into the direction of know thyself. Thank you.